Today, we're telling the story of a young man everyone thought was too wild and untamable to be worth anything. But God only needs a man willing to be used. And this man wanted God to use him. Welcome back to the Church History Podcast. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. I am excited to tell you what I've been working on. A few years ago, I published a book called The Church is Born. That book told the story of the start of the church. And at the same time, I started working on my second book. However, life had some really hard times for me over the last little while, a few years, and I simply wasn't motivated to finish the book. But over the summer, I opened up the files and started working on them again. And I'm excited to say it's almost done. I'm working on final edits, and I hope to have it out by November. So stay tuned for that. The book is called The Church is Corrupted, and it follows the story of the church from Constantine until Martin Luther. I talk about the Crusades, the Inquisition, but I also show how there's great men and women of God who continue to serve him even during those times. I also look at the life of Christopher Columbus and the discovery of the new world. Trust me, you're going to love it. But I'm also releasing a Christmas picture book called The Church and Santa Claus. And in this picture book, you're going to learn the true story of Nicholas and how the church was part of adding to each part of the story of Santa Claus throughout the centuries. I'm really excited about this, and I hope to also release this in November. But we'll have more about that next week. For now, let's start this week's episode. I can't tell you the story I'd planned for today until I first tell you about the start of an organization called, well, you know what, let me just tell you the story. In the bustling city of London in the mid-19th century, a young and earnest draper's apprentice named George Williams found himself deeply troubled by the moral degradation and the spiritual emptiness that surrounded him. The Industrial Revolution had drawn countless young men to the city in search of work, but it left them vulnerable to the temptations of sinful life. George was appalled by the state of society, and driven by his Christian faith, he was determined to make a difference. In 1844, George and a group of like-minded Christian friends began gathering in a small upper room of the draper shop in St. Paul's Churchyard in London. There they prayed, they read the Bible, and they discussed ways to address the spiritual needs of the young men who were flocking to the city. Little did they know that this humble gathering would become the foundation of the Young Men's Christian Association known as the YMCA. The YMCA was born out of George's vision and the efforts of his friends, and it was officially founded. Its mission was to provide a place of Christian fellowship and moral guidance for young men working far away from home. The first YMCA meeting took place on June 6, 1844, and soon they established the organization's guiding principle, which was to improve the spiritual, intellectual, and social conditions of young men. Six years later, in 1851, the YMCA opened its first dedicated building at 72 St. Martin's Lane in London. This marked the beginning of providing young men with spiritual guidance and opportunities for education, physical exercise, and wholesome recreation. Four years later, in 1855, Inspired by the success of the YMCA in London, the movement crossed the Atlantic with the first YMCA in the United States being founded in Boston. From there, it rapidly spread to other American cities and eventually across the whole globe. Ten years later, in 1865, George married a young woman named Helen Jane, and the couple dedicated their life to the YMCA's mission. As the YMCA expanded, George played a central role in its growth, helping to establish new branches and develop its principles. 
Last week, we told the story of the start of the Salvation Army. It was the same year that William Booth walked away from the pulpit and started the work that became the Salvation Army. It was during that same time that the YMCA, Salvation Army, and the Sunday School Movement was working to bring Jesus to the working class. In 1870, in recognition of his significant contributions to the betterment of young men and society, George William was knighted by Queen Victoria. However, he remained humble and committed to the YMCA's mission. In 1902, Sir George Williams passed away in London, leaving a legacy that would continue growing. His vision transformed the lives of countless young men who found guidance, support, and Christian fellowship within the YMCA. George Williams' impact on the church was profound. Through his dedication, faith, and tireless efforts, he gave birth to a worldwide movement that combined Christian principles with practical solutions to address the needs of young people in an ever-changing world. The YMCA became a model for Christian social work, influencing the church and society. George's legacy lives on in the millions of lives touched by the YMCA's mission of nurturing young people's spiritual, intellectual, and physical well-being worldwide. His story is a testament to the power of one individual's faith and determination to create positive change. Today's episode is brought to you by Alexander Henry Coffee. If you use the code CHURCHHISTORY, all lowercase and no spaces, you can receive a 20% discount. If you want some great coffee, check it out. My husband roasts the coffee and let me tell you, our home smells amazing. I'm drinking his coffee right now as I record this and the taste is so smooth. So check out the link in the show notes. Just six years before the very first YMCA meeting, a little boy named Dwight was born. His life would be entwined with the YMCA and the Sunday School Movement. On February the 5th, 1837, Dwight was born in Northfield, Massachusetts. His father had a lot of debt. Dwight had five older brothers and an older sister. Dwight's father was named Edwin. He was a bricklayer and an alcoholic. He used his money from work to drink. And that left him with bills. In order to take care of his large family, he went into massive debt. And when he was only four years old, Dwight's mother was pregnant again. And just one month before the twins were born, Dwight's alcoholic father died. He left the family with a massive debt. It's the early 1830s, in a modest home nestled among the rolling hills of Massachusetts, a heart-wrenching scene unfolded. Betsy, a new widow with nine children, facing the relentless grasp of debt collectors. Her husband Edwin had passed away unexpectedly, leaving a burden of unpaid debts that now threatened to consume their home and their meager possessions. The family's youngest members, two newborn twins, cried softly in their makeshift cradle. Betsy, her eyes heavy with grief and exhaustion, could do little but watch as the debt collectors catalogued and claimed nearly everything within their home. Four-year-old Dwight stood by his mother's side, his face etched with sorrow and anger. He couldn't bear to see his family's belongings carted away by strangers. It wasn't just the furniture and household goods. It was memories, comfort, dignity. As the last piece of their furniture was loaded into a wagon, Betsy turned to Dwight. Tears glistened in her eyes, but she summoned a smile for her son, a brave attempt to shield him from the harsh realities they faced. Betsy's brother arrived shortly after the collectors had left. As he walked around the empty home and looked at his sister with nine children, he had only one piece of advice for her. You have to give your children away, at least your youngest three. There's got to be a family that could take care of them. But Betsy would not think about it. No matter what happened, she was going to keep her children together. To keep them together, the older children would have to go to work. The oldest boy was named Isaiah. For two years, he worked to take care of his family. But after two years, he was tired of caring for his father's responsibilities. 
At age six, Dwight watched as his older brother, his only father figure, walked out the door. Isaiah's leaving meant that the family struggled again to find money for clothes and food. The other children tried to find work, and they did find some work, but it was hard. Dwight, at age six, was sent to work in homes where he was given food as part of his payment. He was able to eat cornmeal, porridge, and a glass of milk to drink. Dwight was a wild child. People would say, there is no way you can tame that child. He had big dreams for his future, and as he got older, his dreams only grew. By the age of 17, Dwight had big dreams. He was going to be a millionaire. No one could convince him it wasn't possible, but he knew. To become a millionaire, you have to live in the city. So, when his uncle from Boston came to visit, Dwight asked if he would hire him to let him come and work at his shoe store. Dwight wanted to move to Boston to live with his uncle. But Dwight's uncle could see he was out of control. He was a ball of energy that no one could control. Dwight's uncle flatly refused. I am not going to be responsible for you in a city. No way. After his uncle returned to Boston without him, Dwight was angry. He decided he was going to go to Boston and find his fortune. And he would prove he didn't need his uncle. So Dwight left home and headed to Boston. The year was 1854. Once in Boston, Dwight began to look for work, but he had no education. He had no experience. He spoke crassly. No one was interested in having Dwight in their workplace. He could not find any place to live. Dwight appeared at his uncle's home and begged him for help, and his uncle agreed, but with some strict rules. His uncle would pick a rooming house where he would live. He would be in that rooming house every evening by an early curfew. And on Sundays, he would go to school. There was a Sunday school near the rooming house, and he would get an education there. And at work, he would listen and do everything his uncle said. Dwight agreed to all of it, even though going to school on his day off, that seemed like a horrible idea. Dwight hadn't been to school since he was a very young child. In fact, He hadn't gone beyond grade five. Dwight's uncle was shocked to find that Dwight was a great shoe salesman. Within a very short time, he became the best salesman at the shop. A year later, Dwight had settled in nicely. He was making good money and still dreaming of being a millionaire. He was attending Sunday school and his reading and writing was improving slightly. But Dwight had a lot of energy and trying to focus on schoolwork, even for one day a week, was not easy for him. He had promised his uncle he would attend Sunday school, but he had not promised he would not cause trouble. Dwight's Sunday school teacher was a man named Edward Kimball. He was awkward and didn't know how to relate to an active and charming student like Dwight. One day, Dwight was working in the shoe store, and he looked up to see a man walk past the shop, then turn around like he was going to walk into the store, but at the last minute he walked past, only to turn around again and walk back to the store. At first, Dwight chuckled at this weird man, and then he panicked. He recognized the awkward walk of his Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. He quickly thought back over the last few weeks. What did he do that made his teacher so mad he was coming to his work to tell his uncle on him? Dwight quickly ducked into the back room of the shop, pretending he needed to stock some shelves, hoping Edward Kimball would leave. Then he heard a noise and looked up to see Mr. Kimball walk into the storage room. The awkward man clearly didn't want to be there any more than Dwight wanted him to be there. Mr. Kimball spoke. Ah, so I know you don't always like being in my class and... I'm unsure how I feel about you being in my class, but I wanted to come to you today and ask you a question. I wanted to know if you believe in Jesus. Then Mr. Kimball put his hand on Dwight's shoulder. Dwight was so confused. Why was his Sunday school teacher talking to him about God at work? You talk about God at church, not at work. And why is his hand on my shoulder? 
It was all so awkward and weird. Dwight's brain was going a million miles a minute. He didn't hear what Mr. Kimball was saying. And then suddenly, Mr. Kimball was opening his Bible and reading? Dwight was thinking, he's reading his Bible in the storage room of my work. But as much as Dwight was not hearing what Mr. Kimball was saying, he had heard the first question. And that question began swirling around in his brain. Do I believe in God? I mean, do I believe in all of it? Do I believe that God is holy? Do I believe that I'm a sinner? Do I believe that God came to earth to die for me, that he rose again? Do I believe? Suddenly, Dwight said, yes, I I do. I do believe. I believe all of this. And that was the moment Dwight became a Christian. There is no grand story. It was an uncomfortable interaction between an awkward Sunday school teacher and an 18-year-old boy in a storage room of a shoe store. God had told Mr. Kimball to visit Dwight and ask him that question. And Mr. Kimball didn't want to. He walked back and forth in front of the store trying to get courage. He felt unqualified. But he did it anyway. God had a great plan for this young man. Edward Kimball wrote about what happened that day. I can truly say, and in saying it, magnify the infinite grace of God as bestowed upon him, that I have seen few persons whose minds were spiritually darker than was his when he came into my Sunday school class. And I think that the committee of the Mount Vernon Church seldom met an applicant for membership more unlikely ever to become a Christian of clear and decided views of gospel truth, still less to fill any extended sphere of public usefulness. When Dwight walked out of the storage room and back into the storeroom, it looked like someone had turned the lights on. Everything seemed bright. And the anger and broodiness that had been in the heart of Dwight since his childhood, was suddenly gone. The year was 1855. The Sunday school was held at the Mount Vernon Congregational Church in Boston, and Dwight began attending every service. He was excited to learn everything about God. God had changed his heart. But he was still the same wild, energetic 18-year-old. In church, When the pastor would say something that impacted him, he would suddenly speak up. At one point, he compared finding Jesus to finding the shoe that is a perfect fit. And the women in the church were appalled. They didn't like having this wild, uneducated teenager speaking out in their church. A man in the church came and said, Dwight, the only way you can serve God is to sit quietly in the pew and never speak again. But God had different plans. The women in the church were so upset about Dwight that they started a boycott of his uncle's shoe store, and Dwight was forced to quit his job. But he decided he would move to an even bigger city. He would move to Chicago, and he would find work there and finish his plan of becoming a millionaire. He found a job very quickly working at a very large shoe store, and almost right away, He was the number one top salesman at the store. His new boss saw right away how talented he was in sales and that he had incredibly good business sense. So his boss began to mentor him. He told Dwight if he continued to work hard and save that in five years he could make $100,000. And within 10 years, he could have a million dollars. He was that talented. Dwight saw all his dreams coming true. Life was great. He continued to work hard and save his money. On Sunday, he went to church. He never missed a Sunday. One Sunday morning, he was walking to church down North Well Street, and he was sidetracked by something, a door with a sign on it. He walked over to the door and cleared away the mud that was on the sign. It said, Mission. Dwight looked around trying to figure out what this building was. He knocked on the door 
and it was opened by an old, sad-looking man. What do you want? I was just wondering what this place is. I saw a sign that said, Mission? Yeah, it's a Sunday school. Dwight lit up. He was so excited. He began to tell the man all about how he had attended a Sunday school and how his teacher had come to his work and how he had found God and that Sunday schools were so important. And then Dwight offered his help. He could be a teacher. The man looked at him. No. What do you mean, no? I mean, no. We don't need teachers. We have 16 teachers and no kids. What do you mean, no kids? The streets are full of children. Your class should be so full. Yeah, kids around here don't care. They don't care about God. They don't care about school. If you could get a classroom full of kids to show up, then go ahead. You can teach them. The man thought he had gotten rid of this annoying, energetic young man, but he had only motivated him. The next Sunday, Dwight woke up early. He headed out into the streets. Kids were everywhere. There was so many of them. And all of them should be in Sunday school. Dwight walked towards where some children were playing ball. And when the ball got away from them, Dwight ran and picked it up. He held the ball over his head and said to the kids, I will give you the best Sunday of your life. Follow me. You're going to have the most wonderful time. At the mission, the old man heard a knock at the door. He opened it to see Dwight standing there with 18 boys. Dwight said, you have 16 teachers. They should be handle 18 kids. I'm going to go get some more. And then he left him with the 18 kids. And he found more. And that was what Dwight did every Sunday from then on. Each week, the Sunday school only grew. And soon, the mission was a thriving, large Sunday school with over 300 children. During the week, he kept working hard at the shoe store. And on Sundays, he worked at the Sunday school. One day, a man from the largest shoe store, the Henderson Shoe Company, came to speak to Dwight. He wanted to set up a meeting with him. When Dwight arrived at the meeting, he was shocked to learn the meeting was with Mr. Henderson himself. He looked at Dwight. I want you to work for me. You're going to travel all over America. You're going to sell our best shoes to the shoe stores. And you're going to have a commission. Mr. Dwight Moody, you are going to be rich. This was everything Dwight had dreamed of. This was great. Then Mr. Henderson said something that made Dwight's heart drop. Now you're only going to be back in Chicago about once a month. Dwight knew that was not going to work. I need to be here once a week. For Sunday school, I can't take the job. I can't just not be with my Sunday school kids. Are you really going to give up this huge job, all this money, for slum kids? Dwight asked if he could have some time to pray about the job. And as he prayed, he talked to his friends about the situation. And one of his friends came up with a solution. His friend worked for the railroad and he offered him his rail pass so he could take the train back to Chicago every Sunday. And that's what he did. He took the job, and every single Sunday, he came back to Chicago. And his class kept growing. Soon, it had a thousand students. During this very busy time in his life, Dwight met a young woman named Emma. He fell in love with this young lady, and the two began dating. Life was going great. And then it got even better. Dwight was called to have another meeting with Mr. Henderson himself. And he was offered a promotion with more money and a large bonus. As Dwight began to calculate the bonus and the new paycheck, he realized that he was only one year away from having saved a hundred thousand dollars. He was two years ahead of his schedule. Everything was perfect. Then, one morning, Dwight woke to the news that Mr. Henderson had died suddenly. Within weeks of his death, the whole business was taken over. 
And not only did he not receive his bonus and his new paycheck, but he was fired and he had to look for work. And the only job available was working at a shoe salesman in a very small shoe store. He was doing the exact same job he did when he was 17 years old. He was sad and depressed. One day, he was visited at the shoe store by a man named Hubert. He was one of the Sunday school teachers at the mission. Hubert had news. He was dying. He was going to go see his family who lived in another state on a farm. He was going to go to die at that farm. But he had a class of teenage girls, and not one of them was a Christian. He wanted to visit each one of them to say goodbye and ask if they would become a Christian. Dwight felt awkward about this, and he did not want to do it. But how do you say no to a dying man? So he went with him and visited each home. The girls all came from very difficult homes. Dwight had to calm down drunk fathers and talk his way into the homes. Dwight saw for the first time the horrible conditions his students were living in. But that day, each girl, one by one, prayed and became a Christian. That day changed Dwight. He knew that God had a different plan for him. Saving to be a millionaire didn't matter. He wanted to change lives. And he heard God say to him, You cannot serve God and money. Dwight rented a small room in the back end of a church. He told God, I don't think I'm good at anything except selling shoes, but I will do whatever you ask me to do. God called him to help run a new club that was being started called the YMCA, and his life changed overnight. When Emma came to visit him, he was so excited to show her all the changes, but Emma didn't see it the way he did, and she broke down into tears. Instead of the nice home he had lived in, he was now living in a small room at the back of a church. Instead of a nice job, he was running a small YMCA club. Dwight saw things from her point of view and could see it didn't look good. But he reminded her they both wanted to serve God. And if Emma would marry him, he would make sure that she would have a home to live in. Emma agreed to marry him and the two were engaged. The year is 1860. Dwight was a young, impulsive, enthusiastic 23-year-old man. It had been seven years since Dwight left home as a 17-year-old, and God had done so much with this young man. America was in unrest. It was an election year, and in a shocking turn of events, a political party that had never been in power before won the election. The first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln was the new president. Dwight heard the news, and then he learned the new president was coming to Chicago to visit. And on his list of places that he wanted to visit was Dwight's Sunday school. President Lincoln had heard that God was doing great things, and he wanted to see it for himself. On November 25th, 1860, President Lincoln spoke to Dwight's Sunday school class. Dwight was honored to meet the new president, but the country was in great unrest, and soon, civil war broke out. Throughout the years of the war, Dwight was asked to come and speak to the troops and motivate them. He was able to speak nine times to the soldiers, and he preached the gospel and led young soldiers to Christ. At his Sunday school, Dwight offered pony rides for the children, and he offered English classes to the immigrants in Chicago. And even during the war, his class continued to grow. It was almost one year into the Civil War that Emma and Dwight were married. And in 1864, a year before the end of the Civil War, Dwight and Emma welcomed their first child, a little girl they named Emma. As the war was ending, Dwight continued his efforts. Both the Sunday school he ran and the YMCA were exploding with children and teenagers. Dwight found a way to use his sales and business skills for God. 
He began to fundraise, and soon he raised enough money to build a space for his Sunday school. But there was a problem. It was a good problem. The Sunday school students were not young children anymore. They were young adults now. But they were still attending his Sunday school, and they refused to leave. So Dwight built a large church with an auditorium that could seat 3,000 people and a Sunday school that met the needs of over 1,000 students. The church was called the Illinois Street Church. The YMCA needed more room, too, because a big part of the draw was giving teenage boys a place to go to be active and healthy in a safe way. They wanted to play games and spend time with other boys, and this was especially important as the Civil War had just ended and everyone had lost people to the war. The nation was grieving. Around 850,000 American men had died in this war. Most of them were young men. The young men who survived needed a place to go to be active and also to find peace and hope. And the YMCA was that place. Dwight raised money to build the Farewell Hall for the YMCA in Chicago. It was the largest place for young men to come together, play sports, work out in the gym, and hear a message about the saving power of Jesus Christ. And Dwight was elected as the president of the Chicago YMCA branch. The year was 1837. Dwight was 30 years old. He was pastoring a large church, running a huge Sunday school program with over a thousand students, president of the Chicago YMCA, and a husband and father to a three-year-old little girl. It was that year that Emma became very sick. She was diagnosed with asthma. In the 1800s, asthma could be a death sentence. The doctor said the possible solution was to get out of the city, and the very best solution would be time spent on the ocean. Dwight decided to take his wife and daughter on a trip across the ocean to England. Dwight always put the needs of his family before his work, and that is something I admire about him. The time at sea helped Emma, and by the time they landed in England in 1864, Emma was feeling much better. While in England, Dwight wanted to meet two people he'd heard about, a German man who was running an orphanage and a preacher who was drawing large crowds. Dwight and Emma first went to the orphanage run by the German man named George Mueller and his wife. We discussed George Mueller in past episodes, and I'll put a link to those in the show notes. Dwight was greatly impacted to see what God was doing with George. He learned about his prayer life, and Dwight began to ask God to use him as well. Dwight and Emma then went to see a preacher named Charles Spurgeon. We're going to do an episode about Spurgeon in January, so stay tuned for that. At Charles Spurgeon's meeting, another man got up to speak and said one sentence that changed his life. Dwight heard this advice. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man wholly committed to him. Not one educated man, not one rich man, not one loved man, just a man. Dwight asked God to let him be that one man. At the Charles Spurgeon Evangelistic Conference, Dwight felt God was calling him to be an evangelist, and he answered that call. It was in 1869 that Emma and Dwight welcomed their second child, a little boy named William. Dwight Moody returned to the United States with a new mission. He would organize evangelistic campaigns, and he would center on major cities, especially New York City and Chicago. While organizing these campaigns, Dwight heard something that changed his life. While at a YMCA convention in Indianapolis, Dwight heard a man singing, and he knew right away what he needed to do. When the meeting was over, Dwight made a beeline to this man. Dwight said, without even introducing himself, You have to come with me. I'm going to preach, and you are going to sing, and we are going to reach millions of people for God. The man looked at him and replied, Um, hello, my name is Ira Snakey. Who are you? And that awkward introduction is how Ira and Dwight connected. And after some prayer time with his wife, Ira agreed. 
he would travel with Dwight and sing before his sermons. He would even move his family to Chicago to live near the Moody family. For a year, Dwight traveled with his young family, Ira, and his family, and thousands of people came to hear the evangelistic services, and hundreds of people came to Christ. God was doing great things. Then, one October night, everything changed. It was October the 8th, 1871. Dwight started his busy Sunday morning at the Sunday school and then returned home to eat and rest. Then, in the evening, he was at the church to preach. As the church neared the end of the service, Dwight changed his normal ending to the service. Instead of having an altar call, he told the congregation to ensure that they were really, really ready to follow Christ. Spend the week praying and make sure the vow you're making to Christ is real and come back next week. That week was the first time that Dwight had no altar call. As the people left the church, the sky looked weird. It looked as if the sky was on fire. At midnight, the moody home was awakened by a loud noise. Someone was banging at his door. He opened the door to see fire. The whole of Chicago was running and trying to leave the city. Dwight grabbed little Emma and William as his wife grabbed a few blankets and they ran out the door. Dwight hooked up his horse to the cart as Emma packed the kids in tight and the little family fled through the streets and out of Chicago. As they fled through the streets, Dwight could smell the burning flesh. The Chicago Fire of 1871 burned from October the 8th until October 10th. Over 300 people were killed. It is estimated that the fire cost $200 million in damages. The cause of the fire was never discovered. In the center of Chicago, the business district was completely gone. Four miles long and one mile wide was gone. When the fire was out, Dwight returned to see the damage. His home was gone. Everything he owned was gone. The large church, the large Sunday school, gone. The YMCA farewell hall, gone. Even Ira had lost his home. Dwight stood where his pulpit would have been. He knelt there, trying to pray. The last time he had been there in that exact spot, he had not given an altar call. He had told his congregation to think and come back next week, but there would be no next week. He had said to return to church, but there would be no church. He had said to come to the altar next week, and a week later, there was no altar. Dwight never again ended a service without an altar call. And there, on the ground where the altar should have been, he confessed his sins to God. In tears, he cried out to God. All your work, God, is gone. Your church is gone. Your Sunday school is gone. Your YMCA is gone. Your work is gone. And then he heard the still, quiet voice of God. My work is not gone. Buildings are gone. The work is just getting started. Get up and go and help my people. Emma came to join Dwight, and the couple began collecting things to give to the people who had lost everything. Crowds gathered. They had just faced death, and they wanted to know more about the hope Dwight had talked about. And next week, we're going to look at the second half of Dwight's life. At this point in the story, he is 34 years old. God still had great things for Dwight to do. So make sure you listen next Thursday for part two of Dwight's life. Today we know Dwight as D.L. Moody, and I'm so encouraged by his life. As I researched him, I thought if he was born today, he probably would have been diagnosed with ADHD. He came from the poorest parts of rural America. He had no education. He spoke with poor grammar. As a new believer, he was told by the church the only way God could use him is if he sat in the church and was quiet. He was someone that no one thought could amount to anything. But remember, God only needs someone 
who is willing to be used. Dwight had lost everything. The church, the Sunday school, the YMCA, all burned in the great fire. And now he was waiting to see what God wanted him to do. And that is when he received a letter. Come back next Thursday to find out what was in that letter. 